that when you go through many, many years of, of a structural supply deficit in silver, and at the same time, the speculators who bought it thinking that they, a lot of them thought they'd get rich, and, and I never sell metal to get wealthy. It is wealth and probably will end up making you wealthy. You have strong enough fingertips, but these people are getting more and more frustrated. Many are capitulating, as you say, and, and that, that big rise everyone expects that attracted them in the first place to me in that contrarian environment seems to be getting, getting imminently closer because of that. There are very few things on the planet, in my opinion, that offer the potential that silver does. And I, I try to poke holes in that. It has better upside potential than just about any asset on the planet. It is more undervalued than any asset on the planet. It has as many uses as any asset on the planet. And it's decreasing in nature. Aluminum slid and nickel paired earlier gains after a package of U.S. sanctions omitted any major curbs on Russian industrial metals. The action announced on Friday included measures against more than 500 people and entities linked to Russia's war machine, but left the country's base metals industries unscathed. The two metals had been buoyed this week by expectations that the package might put pressure on supplies. Viscount Mining and Lux Network launched silver backed NFTs. The collaboration between Viscount Mining and Lux Network isn't just about launching an advanced technological platform. It's a bold step towards democratizing the mining industry. By leveraging Lux's proprietary quantum safe blockchain technology, this partnership makes it possible for anyone to invest in silver, transforming the way we think about asset ownership and investment. Gold rises despite Fed caution on rate hikes. On Thursday, Governor Christopher Waller said that he was in no rush to cut rates. He also said that January's figures may have been driven by one-time quirks, many companies raise prices at the start of the year, or they may suggest inflation is stickier than we thought, we just don't know yet. Fed official Patrick Harker, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, also expressed caution about cutting rates too soon. Gold stocks struggled at the start of the year, performing worse than the metal itself. This was likely due to disappointing operating results and guidance for the sector. Sentiment towards gold stocks has been poor, leading to overselling after any negative news. For example, Barrick Gold saw a drop in its share price despite analysts maintaining their targets. While companies must provide accurate guidance, it seems that negative sentiment towards the gold sector is exacerbating market reactions. Now, we'll show you more clips before. Check our pinned comment for some massive sign-up bonuses if you want to add crypto to your commodities portfolio. Enjoy the video. Because when everyone finally lets go and says, I'm done, I can't take this anymore, that's when we see the rise. But when you talk about an asymmetrical risk-reward type of environment, what can I invest in that has the lowest downside risk and the best upside? I don't see a better thing in the world than silver, Jesse. And I, I try to be objective. I mean, if you're, if you're um, not objective, you're full of crap and people will, will bust right through it. I think to myself, I mean, you know, you look at the, at the Silver Institute who's telling us the supply demand fundamentals and they ignore the military industrial complex. They don't even put that in there. I gave a speech at the VRIC the other day, and you, were, you and I were talking about that. Usually that's where we see each other in Vancouver. And two years ago, I gave a speech, and I, I've been saying for a long time that, you know, there's, um, there's 500 ounces of silver in the tip of a Tomahawk cruise missile. For years, I've been saying that. And I, last year, not this last one, but the year before I gave a speech, and a man came up to me and he said, you know, I work uh, as a consultant for the Department of Defense. And he says, I, I know there's some silver in there. I'm going to check on that. Now, I never heard back from him. I, I go and, and gave my speech again this year, and lo and behold, there he was. He had a handful of pictures. He said, everything I'm going to show you is declassified. And he showed me how they, they tested the, the Tomahawk cruise missile uh, in the ocean in California on an on a, a automated bed about 50 feet under the water and, and how they had problems uh, um, shooting the Tomahawk cruise missile vertically instead of horizontally because of the the guidance system and this and that. And he says, yeah, this was my baby. And he says, I got to tell you something. You're right. There's between 14 and 15 kilograms in the tip of a Tomahawk cruise missile, almost exactly 500 ounces. You're spot on. And um, this is a guy who, who, who worked on the Tomahawk cruise missile program. Now, that's just one form of 
of, of munition. I mean, there's all sorts of high tech weaponry and, and missiles and, you know, and, and, and aerospace and, and, and stealth fighters. All of these things need copious amounts of silver, yet it's not talked about in the supply demand fundamentals. And I, I just, to me, when you see a country like India, Jesse, buy 400 million ounces of silver in the last two years, that's almost twice as much as is on COMEX. That's what we know of. This is not lost on a lot of the, uh, the world. I believe silver should be reclassified not as a industrial metal, which certainly it is in green and, and digital applications around the globe, but maybe much more than that is a strategic metal where it is needed in things like warfare. And if you look around all of a sudden, we're, we're currently bombing two countries. We're involved in wars all around the world. And if we're not directly involved in them, it seems as though the, the companies who ma manufacture all this stuff in the United States are supplying the wars all around the world. Now, is it too far-fetched to think, or is there is the line between conspiracy and reality not thin enough to realize that maybe there's something bigger at play here, that the people who are kind of pulling the strings around the world have made a fortune in, in creating war, and they need silver period, in order to do it. And this is why I think you're seeing, this is the one thing they did not count on, Jesse, was um, countries like India standing for delivery, draining the exchanges. And if you look at the amount of silver that's left the COMEX over the last two and a half years, it's pretty damn close to what India's accumulated. Now, it didn't all come from, from here, but my point to you is that there are a lot of countries around the world who aren't telling us the silver that they produce and accumulate. And I truly believe logarithmic decay that we will wake up one morning as the biggest, smartest money in the world, the most sophisticated, knowing the playbook, knowing where we are, who continues to accumu accumulate these commodities while the Western markets, which are just ridiculous in their overt manipulation right in your face, are actually falling right into their hands. And when we created this game, these countries were not able to really stand up on their own. They were, many of them were third world. And now all of a sudden they're industrialized, they're wealthy and they know the game and they're finding safety in numbers and they are accumulating things like silver. So there are very few things on the planet, in my opinion, that offer the potential that silver does. And I, I try to poke holes in that. It has better upside potential than just about any asset on the planet. It is more undervalued than any asset on the planet. It has as many uses as any asset on the planet, and it's decreasing in nature, and it is disappearing. And the things that are used in industry, most of them are in landfills, such tiny amounts in a cell phone or in a motherboard or blown up in a bomb. Point of it is, is that this is one of those deals where, like I was saying, you know, they're going to shake you best you can from the tree. And just when you let go, that's when it'll move. But again, you don't own it to get wealthy. It is wealth, albeit might be the best investment I've ever seen in my career. Now, Andy Sheckman explains the worldwide secret agenda and why gold and silver play a key role in the new world order with the current de-dollarization that's being happening over the past few months. Things connected from this agenda where you know, you'll own nothing and be happy. The, the divisiveness that, that we've seen, this green agenda, as an example, killing the petrodollar, the consequences of which I believe people have no idea. We, you know, we signed an executive order to go green. We weaponized the dollar. And now we see the majority of all human population joining in this group when you consider the Belt Road Initiative, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, and, and the BRICS. And now the 35 countries <clears throat> that have formally applied on top of the 10 and another 20 info, you're talking the majority of human population is rallying against the West because, well, we're going green amongst other things. And so if they don't need to value oil in dollars, the that's the Klaus Schwab moment, which we've talked about before, where the dollar gets dumped and interest rates spike to compensate for the hyperinflation that hits our shores as everyone for 50 years has had to stockpile dollars creating that synthetic demand and it creates hyperinflation. Rates go to the moon. You can't have 30% inflation and 5% rates, your currency dies. So now rates go, the banks collapse, they're over leveraged and underclass uh, capitalized. The dollar dies because everyone's dumping it and stocks, bonds and real estate all collapse in the face of spiked interest rates. And now you have someone to blame, Xi Jinping and OPEC and everyone else that did this to us. There's your Klaus Schwab moment. But when you talk about that, 
I mean, it's scary as hell and, and maybe even worse in the face of the woke agenda that's killing this country, the whitewashing of our culture, the destabilization through open borders and massive debt, both publicly and privately and undercapitalization across the board and the political craziness and the divisiveness and the two-tier justice system. It just seem, seems that everything's getting worse. So while I would love to believe that things are getting better, and there is certainly a little bit of a greater awareness to it, um, I don't know. To me, it just seems almost like things are getting worse. Now, I don't know if that's all tied into the WEF agenda. You know, it's interesting. They had on their on their website right before the, the, the pandemic, you know, they were simulating what would happen in, in, in a pandemic. And now they're simulating what would happen in a global cyber attack. And, you know, now you see companies like JP Morgan are spending Fifteen billion a year on on cyber threats, on on protecting their system, and how real is it? How connected is everything? And you know, how about the power grid and and the water system and all of this stuff that is quite antiquated? Or the you know, they keep talking about solar flares or or a nuclear weapon being detonated uh, in the atmosphere. And lo and behold, Russia now has they're talking about capability to issue it for a, a, a ICBM up in space. I know I'm all over the place here, but I want people to understand that all of these things in my mind are connected and whether they be loosely connected or directly connected. So, yes, I am a patriot and I want to believe in my soul. I got three kids, man. I want to believe that things are getting better. But I look around me and I see the stupidity, literally the stupidity in so many people and so many organizations that just I shake my head. I can't believe it. And where 30% of this country thinks the current administration is doing a good job to the point where you can't even have a discussion citing facts. I, I, I had a conversation with someone who I believe is one of the smartest people I know, just reads the wrong stuff, very well read, but not reading the right stuff. And I said, can you believe the number of Chinese nationals that are coming in across the Mexican border carrying two me suitcases and wearing a nice clean shirt? They didn't walk from Central America. She says, she says I, I didn't see that. Where are you seeing this? What do you think of today's episode? Do you agree with Andy Sheckman? Do you feel secure?